Hello, everyone. This is Juan Carlos, and welcome to Trail Unedited, where we highlight amazing coaches, athletes, and everyday people from trail communities for fun, unscripted, and unedited conversations. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with a runner, coach, and author, Jennifer Ferroni. Welcome to Trail Unedited, uh, Jennifer. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule uh, to speak with me today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's a pleasure. Oh, I'm, I'm excited to have you on. Um, like I told you uh, before we got started, uh, you have a really interesting, inspiring uh, story. And I just can't wait uh, for everybody to learn about you. So for those listening and watching, Jennifer, I mean, like I said before, I'm in awe and inspired by you. I learned so much when I was learning about your story. Um, you know, as a trail runner, you've had many races, You've won many races. You've podiumed many times. I mean, for example, first female. Uh, and this one you got to tell me about. Record holder, Limber Loss Challenge 26K 2018. Record holder? How fast did you do that? I don't remember. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty well known for not recording my times. I don't pay attention. <laughs> I just run. I cross the finish line and then I'm happy. <laughs> And then first female, Seton Soaker 2018. I did that race the, the following year, 2019, and they came in second place. Congrats. And congrats to you too. <laughs> I love that trail park. Um, third place, female, Canadian Cross Country Masters Championship, first age group uh, in Kingston, sorry. Ontario. Wow. My kids were there cheering me on. It was fun. And then first place at uh, Mesquite Canyon, half marathon, Arizona, 2018. Another record holder. How fast did you do that? Or you wait, you didn't write it down. <laughs> no, but I had a great medal from it. And it was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Second place, North Face Championships, 50K San Francisco, 2016. That's incredible. That was a tough race. In San that Francisco? was a tough race yeah. i wanted to go because that was the championship so i wanted to see oh, again man. what is it like when you have more people there competing and that was that was a tough race but fun but tough and then overall winner north face blue mountain marathon ontario 2016 that's that's incredible where i can say i beat the men that is incredible now was this during the same time as the ocr uh, obstacle course championships at Blue Mountain? Um, no, but I remember there was, um, have you heard of the November Project? No. It's this big group where it started in the U.S., but anyway, every year they pick a destination for their race where all their members across North America come. So that year at that race, the November Project was there. The vibe, the energy was so great. And that is the race where at the awards ceremony, I was crowd surfed. And it was oh, so fun. Wow. <laughs> that is incredible. So, and you have many races, first place, second place. That's incredible. Like you have such an impressive resume. Um, it, it's just incredible. Wow. Now, there are two other ones that I want to that you did in their duathlons, but I'm going to save those because I have a question for you for those. And they're really interesting. So, but first there, you know, the one thing that people do want to know and they're interested in knowing is who is Jennifer Ferrioni? Ooh. A little bit about yourself. That's a tough question. Um, I, I would say I'm, I'm just your average girl that everything okay. I do, I do for passion. You know, like when I get into the sports, it's all about the passion and not about the competitiveness. And I think because I do it for passion, I yeah. just do well at it. And, you know, I initially I worked in healthcare and then I left my job because I just wasn't passionate about it. So I then became, you know, I wrote my first book and I became more involved with writing because I was very passionate about it. I did more coaching. I got into the trail running clinics. Um, became a Reiki practitioner and end of life. It's all because everything I do, it's about what I'm passionate about. And I love a lot of things as opposed to just one thing. Okay. So 
How did you get started as a runner? And when did you discover it was something that you love to do? I first started running as a way to irritate my sister. <laughs> um, and even then it wasn't to get into running. She, um, I think we were in high school and my sister was doing cross country yeah. and she didn't want to run by herself. So she asked me to come run with her. So yeah. I did and I beat her and it really irritated her. So I thought, huh, this is kind of fun. <laughs> and then I did a few races with the school, but it was really more to hang out with the boys on the bus. Like, I, I gotta say, like, I enjoyed that part. Good move. And then in university, but then I never, it never stuck with me. And then in university, I just wanted to join, I wanted to join a group and I wanted to learn how to run, but I was too intimidated because I never really trained. But then when I found out um, that the University of Ottawa, that you could train with the cross country team, but not be part of the racing team, I thought, bingo, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Like I wanted that's to learn great. how to run. Wow. Uh, so I joined the team and then I just happened to make the team, but I was like, you know, at the back of the team. Um, and then that's kind of where it took off. Like I can remember being at Ottawa University and thinking, oh my God, I just ran 20 minutes along the canal. Holy cow, that is long. <laughs> like, I was so impressed that I was able to yeah. run for 20 minutes. And then that 20 minutes quickly turned into an hour and a half, two hours. Um, and then I would say it wasn't until I moved to Toronto in 2000, where I joined a local running group. I was running with the boys. Um, and then just really discovered that, hey, I have like, I have some speed, but I really enjoy this. And uh, it took off from there. And then from there, I always joked that my mind, like I always said, God gave me the ability to run, like the body to run, but he didn't give me the mindset because my body was fast, yet my mind was not there because I didn't want to be known as the fast runner. Gotcha. I wanted to just show up at races and just run. And if I won, great. But I didn't want to be known and have those expectations. Okay. And that's how I got into trail running was to get away from that competitive environment. And same with duathlon. Yeah. Oh. So what would be your preference, trail running or road running? Oh, trail running, hands down. The only time I road run now is to get to the trailhead. <laughs> <laughs> I have no motivation to run on the road at all. <laughs> <laughs> everybody that i talk to a lot of my friends that we all agree trail running there's just nothing like it no and once once you get on the trails and you experience it and i think that's li my little life mission my secret mission is to convert every road runner to a trail runner one runner at a time <laughs> the day i move uh me and the wife we said yeah we know, we have to go near the trails we have to find a place where we can go and there's a lot of trails no more road because yeah. I'm in the city, so it's really hard, and I have to travel mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to trail run. So, um, Jen, you have accomplished a lot of runs, or a lot, and you've run countless miles. Do you even have an idea at this point how many miles you've run so far? I don't keep a log. <laughs> I don't even know why I asked. <laughs> I, I do have, like, a Garmin and a Suntil watch, but I just ordered my new Timex watch. I'd like to just, if I time it, I time it yeah. with my Timex watch. I don't track, but I wasn't always that way. Like there was a time when I kept a log book. Okay. But I think over the years, I've just, it's not that I'm lazy and I don't want to know. I think it's just, I know myself enough as a runner now and I know it works for me. And yeah. that's where I'm able to bring in my coaching hats as well. That um, I just prefer to just run based on how I feel on any given day. But I am lucky that I have the knowledge to be able to see the big picture and to look at it in context of the rest of the week, right? So if I know that I have a big long run coming up with friends or just on my own, I'll know not to push it too much two days Thank before. Um, but otherwise, no, unless I'm training, it's really only if I'm training for something very specific where I will make a point of, calculating things in advance to make sure that I'm getting the proper training in, but I'm not, I'm not rigid in being, I have to track everything because you know, as well, when you're on the trails, 
right? A 10 K on a trail one day can be very different on a different exactly. trail. So I'm definitely exactly. more time on my feet as opposed to distance. Yeah, exactly. Um, so here's the, um, here's the question regarding uh, two of your runs, two, two duathlons that you did. So you competed at the World Duathlon Championships in 2013 and 2014. In 2013, you won gold medal. In 2014, you won a bronze medal. Take us on a journey. What or how did it feel to compete at that level with so many athletes wanting top spot? And how did you navigate through all those athletes to win gold in 2013 and then bronze the next year? Like, that's incredible. So take us through that journey. How did that feel? It was fun. That's what I would say. I mean, 2013, it was great because it was my first world's duathlon and it was on home turf in Canada. So, awesome. you know, there was just so much pride with being here in Canada, even though it's not a big deal in Canada. It just, for me, it was just like the best. Um, and I was so lucky that I had, um, I have four close girlfriends from Northern Ontario where I'm from. So they came and joined me that weekend to cheer me on. And then I awesome. had another close friend on the course as well. So knowing that they were out there cheering me on was the best. Um, and what was neat with the, the Ottawa race was there was myself and another woman, Sasha, who is a wicked athlete. And she has since come on to be like one of the top Canadian runners. Um, but I remember on the first part of the run, uh, the 10K portion, we were coming into the transition together. And I was thinking, this is so great. Two Canadians leading the pack coming into transition. And I'm, I'm about to give her like a high five. Be like, <laughs> <laughs> next thing I know, she just like sprints away from me so that she can technically be first place. And so I'm like, okay, good. Canada's one and two going into transition. This is great. And then the rest of the race, I was just so happy because I knew my girlfriends were out there. And to me, like, it just took that edge off. Yes, I was there to compete, but it was also such a magical memory. And then being on the podium was so fun to just be up there with the flag. You know, it, you, it, you're just so proud. You yeah. feel like, but you're so proud, right? And, and all that training just came together. And then the next year was a very different experience though, because now remember what I said earlier about like, I like to show up at races and not have expectations. So now all of a sudden it was, Oh my God, there's expectations. Yeah. And I had a lot of conflict because on one hand I wanted to see, because even though I won gold, I still had this perception of, yeah, but the race was in Canada. So it didn't attract the top athletes because Europeans don't want to come to Canada. Right. So there was part of me that wanted to go to Europe and see what was the competition like in Europe, because that's where you're going to get it. Right. Yeah. But then there was a part of me that's like, yeah, but if I become competitive, what happens to my passion for just doing it? So there's always this dual conflict when it comes to racing with those two sides. Interesting. Um, so I had a lot of anxiety going into the race. And I actually worked with the woman who I call her my energy healer. And we developed a race strategy where I put on my arrow bars, three different hair elastics, a blue, a red, and a yellow. And the yellow band was to represent my bubble around me, to remind myself that no matter what in this race, I'm racing for myself and yeah. that I can just stay in this protective bubble, or if I chose to, I could get out of my bubble if I wanted to. Yeah. So that's what the yellow was. And then the blue was the calm, to represent calmness, so that if I started to feel anxious, I would just bring in the blue energy. And then the red was that power, that fire, that if I wanted to go for it, I would just focus on the red and I would go. And that, that worked great. so good. It worked so good. And I remember going into the race, talking in the, like, the village, um, and, and people were like, well, of course you're going to go down the big hill. Cause there was a big descent. There was a big climb and there was a big descent, but they were calling for rain, a lot of rain. And I, I'm a bit of a chicken. Um, and I remember people saying, of course, you're going to ride in your arrow bars. You're the gold winner. You have to ride in arrow bars. And I'm thinking, uh, -uh it's raining. Like no way. I'm, just like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not 
I'm not this courageous person. <laughs> Told you I'm an open book. So when the race started, I don't know, something just clicked. I got into the zone. I focused on my things. When I went down the hill in the rain, I just got into arrow and I just went with it. And um, wow. I remember the last part of the race, um, the woman in front of me, I think I was 11 seconds behind her and I could see her and I tried to catch her. And if I think if I had another 200 meters, I would have got her, but it just, it wasn't enough. But it was such a great feeling to know that I went into that race with a lot more anxiety and I was over to, I was able to overcome it and confront my fears and awesome. still pull off. And what was the best was in the washroom afterwards, the winner, the gold medalist, she came up to me in the bathroom afterwards because in the front run, we were neck and neck in that first run. She came up to me and gave me the biggest hug in the bathroom. Oh, that's said, awesome. Thank you so much for pushing me. You were the best. You made me push so hard. And she said it in such a lovely and friendly way. And, and for me, like that is why I compete, right? It's, it's not to be like, I'm better than you. It's just, we're all here for that common purpose. And there was this winner that showed me that in the bathroom afterwards and just made me so, so happy. That is awesome. And, you know, there are so many athletes in so many sports where sportsmanship, people just have good sportsmanship. And then, and when you push, you know, I guess for me, I've been in races where I've, I've been in close races with, with other athletes who are now friends of mine. And that level of competition is like no other because you push each other to those mm -hmm. different boundaries and you break those limits and those barriers that you never thought you could. And it's just, and at the end, it's, it's just that, th that connection where you just give each other a hug and it's like, thank you so much for pushing me. Yeah. Cause you just know that just simply by being there, you're helping yeah. each other. Out. Yeah. It is the greatest feeling. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. So Jen, you are now a mom of two. Mm -hmm. So, Becoming a parent, has it changed your outlook on life, training, and running? Oh, my God, definitely. Um, and I'm so grateful for that because, and you, perhaps you found the same. Um, when I became a parent, all of a sudden, it, it just really helped to put things in perspective. Yeah. And um, it really helped me to focus on quality versus quantity right? Which might be a reason why I'm not, I'm not anal when it comes to recording what I'm doing, because at the end of the day, I'm a mom first, right? So of if course. training gets derailed, then fine. But in my first year after having Sophia, that's when I had a lot of my personal bests. And I think it, a lot of it had to do because of the mentality shift, right? And, and the fact that yeah. it was like, whatever I do, I'm going to make it quality and make it worth my while. And that really helped me to drill into every workout has a purpose. And that's something I convey to my athletes all the time is every single workout has a purpose and you always need to question it. And there's been so many times when I've been racing where I think of my kids and I think about what type of message do I wanna send them? So for instance, yeah. when um, that, that race where I had the concussion, um, I still, I still finished the race, but during the race, I had a massive panic attack and it was because of the concussion. And it happened at the top of the mountain on the mountain ridge where I totally flipped out like massive panic attack. I think there's an urban legend now about remember that girl from Ontario that <laughs> had the panic attack. But at one point, the thing that calmed me and allowed me to finish the race was I thought of my daughter. I thought, what would you tell Sophia right now if this was her and she was so afraid, what would you tell her to calm her? And then I chuckled because I'm like, no, what would she tell me? Because she's my mother hen, like my little girl, well, she's 14. She is such a mother. Um, and that's what helped me to be like, you have to just keep going. You know, you want to be that role model to your kids that yeah. no matter how hard it is, you just keep going. So I really do think that, you know, being a mom has changed the way I approach the sport in so much, in so many better ways. 
Yeah. And having them at races, whether they were really tiny and I'm breastfeeding them at the finish line or they're there on the course handing me water or they're finishing the last mile with me or I have such a stack of wonderful um, memories, yeah. memories, but notes that they write me and sneak into my suitcase before awesome. I the race. They're, they're my biggest fans. I'm going to talk to mine. Why they never did that? Oh, <laughs> like, what's going on with you guys? I thought it was your favorite. <laughs> They thought this was pretty cool. We've been watching. So you know how you did the interview with Emma Roca yes. a few weeks ago? Yes. The kids and I, we've been watching that race. Oh my God. That's awesome. I told them, I'm like, do you remember that girl, the woman who's the team captain and she's a firefighter and a PhD? They're like, yeah. I'm like, well, he interviewed her and now he's interviewing me. Yes. <laughs> like, I know. You're cool. <laughs> Oh my God. And you know what? Talk about inspiring women. You, Emma Roca, Melissa Coombs. Uh, like there's so many amazing uh, female athletes who are also moms. How you guys do it, I don't know. But the, the, I guess the best thing about this type of program is you, uh, for me, I get to learn about the various athletes, the number, like the types of athletes that you guys are and what drives you and what inspires you and that to me is just like the greatest story i love that you're so kind <laughs> but um well i'm glad that the kids love it now you can show them this episode when it airs and it's you can show them and they're gonna be like mom is cool <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah. hey kids tell your friends <laughs> my daughter she's so cute whenever we're at chapters She'll go into the, the, the bookstore and we'll go to the computers where you can yeah. research books. And she always calls up the book that I wrote. And she'll walk around the store and put it up on every computer screen in the store just to be like, this is my mom. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. That is great. Um, Jen, let's touch, uh, let's talk about your book. So The Athletic Mom-to-Be, Training Your Way into Pregnancy and Motherhood. Uh, can you give us a quick overview of the book and we can dive into the details as we go, but, you know, give me a premise of the book and why you decided it was important to write it. Um, again, it really was just a way to share information and help other women because yeah. we all go through very similar things. And it started where um, I'd had my daughter and I was training to do a marathon and then I got injured in a mummy daughter aerobics class yeah. and I was going to physio. And I was having a talk with the physio about how, because she was saying it's very common for women postpartum to get injured because of just the changes to your body. Yeah. And we were talking about how, like, it's a shame that that knowledge is not more widely available and that it's hard to find good information. And she just made a comment. She's like, Jan, you should write a book. So I just thought, sure, why not? I had no writing experience, but I had a passion for it. So um, I started interview. I, I got this idea to write a book about women in pregnancy and motherhood. And as I started interviewing people, I came across Carol Ann, who was a chiropractor that did research in that area. And we didn't know each other, but we met and we thought, let's work on this together. And, um, and that's how we got the book started. And it's, it's a, obviously I sound biased, but I really think it's a great resource for women. It's, it's based on latest available guidelines. Um, but we've also interviewed over 50 uh, expert matters, experts in the field. So whether, you know, they're doctors, chiropractors, osteopaths, whatever. But we also interviewed over 50 women athletes, ranging from recreational athletes to Olympians, to just share their story and just share advice. So the book is I forget now how many chapters there are, but just postpartum, there's, I think, six chapters. And it covers yeah. not just the physical aspects, like the changes to your body, but so much of the emotional. We have a chapter called Pacing Your Mind, because you don't just stop being an athlete, and you don't just stop that, that drive that's in you to push yourself harder just because you get pregnant. So how do you deal with that? Right? So it's very holistic in nature in terms of what it, what it covers. And it was such a fun experience it took That's me eight, awesome. it took us eight years to write it because i had two wow. kids, right and carol ann and i were both working full-time um but 
Oh, it was so much fun writing it. Yeah. Wow. Now, I, I mentioned some of your accomplishments, uh, a list of your runs. Uh, majority, you podiumed. So congratulations. But in addition to that, you know, being a, 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 a runner, uh, you know, a coach, mom, an author, um, I know a lot of people that would struggle um, with finding balance in their lives. How do you manage to balance it all? Uh, there's days I don't, for sure. I'm human. Um, I would say it's just, I mean, I'm, I'm always thinking about what is it that I, I want to do today? And what is it that I need to do? And I just, I have my different buckets and I just try to divvy up the week so that I'm giving attention to each of those buckets. And there's going to be, um, there's always going to be waves where there'll be a period where I'm focusing a lot more about coaching and then okay. something else will quiet. So I guess I never feel that I have to be in my A game in all areas all at once. I just really believe that things happen as they should. Yeah. Um, I'm not just passive, but I also, I just really believe that timing is everything. So for instance, my trail running camps and retreats, those are usually in the spring and the fall. So there'll be times where I really need to focus on it and other times where I can just let it go and focus on something else. Yeah. Um, but I'm also a queen at making lists and prioritizing my schedule. Yeah. Uh, I'm an early bird. I love getting up early in the morning and that's when I get a lot of my work done. Um, and I always make exercise a priority because I really don't think I would be able to approach my day the way I do if I didn't have my exercise. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And then I, I just, I have my, I have my rituals that help me out a lot. So for instance, tomorrow night or tomorrow, I'm going away for two days just to recharge my batteries. I'm also scouting out trail running camps for next year. That's going to involve wineries, <laughs> um, trail running and wine. Um, but that's also a way for me to just get away and just recharge my batteries. And I really make a point of doing stuff like that or on a really small scale. Like I try once a week to head out of the city and just get out and hit the trails out of the city where I can just recalibrate and just refocus. And that's usually where my ideas come from where I feel calmer. Um, it's just by carving out those little chunks of time to exercise. Yeah. Um, and also things like my Reiki practice. Like I do Reiki on myself every day. Some days it's just for five minutes. Some days it's for 20 minutes, but that okay. really helps as well. You know what? I'm glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that Reiki. Can you explain what that is? Because there's, there's a lot of people that don't know what that is. Yeah, and I don't even know if I'm the best person to explain it. Um, basically, it's, it's, it's originated from Japan, and it's a hands-on healing technique. And healing, not curing. So I'll just put that out there. But it's healing <laughs> on emotional, physical, mental levels. Okay. And it's, just, it's a very light, um, using my hands. I'm either just placing my hands either directly on you or just hovering above you. And it's just working with the energy. So going with the principle that energy is all around us and within us. And for a variety of reasons that energy might get disrupted, it might get stuck, it might get weakened. Uh, so it's just about balancing that energy. It's, it's very simple in that sense. No, that's great. Is there a moment in your athletic career you are most proud of? I know I often get asked that question and I, I would say there's not one. Instead okay. there's several. And it's things like, I remember when I did my first ultra and coming through that last kilometer and my kids joining me on that kilometer that you know will always stand out being on the podium and seeing my Northern Ontario girlfriends cheering me on, even in Spain, being on the podium and being the person that I am, not realizing the Canada flag was upside down. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. <laughs> That's just, Who doesn't make that mistake? <laughs> yep. 
And then I think it's, it's like, I always get visions of the views that I see when I'm racing. It's, it's, awesome. it's things like that, that really stand out for me or that the marathon at Blue Mountain where, you know, it's the only race where I was first overall and I beat the, beat the boys. Good but job. it was more the fact that that particular race was one of the very few races where I actually went into the race with a strategy, like where it was okay, I'm going to race it and I'm going to race it this way. I don't usually do that. I usually just show up and I run. And when I feel like I can push myself, I push myself. When I feel like I need to ease back, I ease back. But with that particular race, I had a breakthrough moment the night before. And um, I was able to then actually have a strategy for that race. And I saw, oh my God, this worked really good. And this felt great, right? So that feeling is what stands out that I did something different and I had something really great. That is um, awesome. Yeah. Um, with COVID-19, of course, uh, it has impacted the, run the running season for a lot of people worldwide. Um, as an athlete, how has this changed your life and how has it impacted your business? It's, well, I would say from the personal side, it hasn't been too different because of the recovery from a concussion because I wasn't into doing as much as I normally was. I would say the biggest disappointment though, was I was gearing up to doing a five day stage race, the Trans Selkirk. And I was really oh, wow. looking forward to doing that one. Cause I was going with a group of friends and it was going to yeah. be a fantastic experience. And I love the stage racing. Like I really do love that element of pushing yourself hard. And then you're like, how am I going to do this again tomorrow? Repeat times five. Right. Okay. I was really disappointed to see that have to come to a halt. Um, and like I said earlier, I miss, I miss that environment. Right. But from my day to day training, it didn't change it too much. Um, other than there's not the pressure that I need to go out and run for five hours. I'm happy to go out for two, two and a half hours and enjoy it and know that I don't have to go harder if I don't want to. But from my coaching perspective, it's been great. It's been really neat because with the athletes I'm working with, and I, and I kind of attracted a whole new set of athletes during COVID, where I would say the common theme has been around exploring, helping them explore their relationship with running yeah. and finding the meaning in their running. And from that, the performance just comes naturally with it. Um, so I've been able to do a little bit more clinics They've been more informal. Like I ha usually in the past, I would have to post about clinics and, yeah. and attract people. This time they kind of just come. Um, nice. That, yeah. And that's been really great. And I really, I've been enjoying it so much. And even right now with my women's trail running retreat in a few weeks, I think more than ever now people need to have this opportunity to escape to the trails and just let go of everything else that's going on in their lives. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's been really a neat experience because I'm finding a lot of people that I'm coaching, there's an element of life coaching that's been coming in and helping them to explore how is their running interacting with their day to day life or more, how does their beliefs in their everyday life come into play with their running? It's hard to explain, but it's been really, I get it. it's been really interesting because with no races being on the table, it's making people really question what are they doing and why with their running. Yeah. So we've been helping them to find new challenges, like how do you motivate yourself? And yeah. always this notion of should versus want. Now there's such that great opportunity to really look at like, well, what do you want to do? Not because you have a race in seven weeks that you need to train for, but what is it that you're really feeling inspired to do? And also what is hmm. it that you fear? Interesting. Um, and I've been helping a lot of athletes work on their fears, fears of being uncomfortable with pushing themselves, fear of getting out in the trails on their own, um, anything and helping them to just face them and, and to embrace it and to really enjoy it. So it's been fun. That is awesome. Are there places in the world you have been able to see that you probably wouldn't have seen if you weren't a competitive athlete? 
Well, I think just in general, um, it's definitely helped me to, no matter where we go, I incorporate biking or running. Because for me, that is the best way to see a place, right? So a couple of years ago, when we took the kids to Europe, the first thing I did was find a trail race in the French Alps so that I could go, you know, explore it. I can't wait to do the same. (laughs) Yeah. And then like, then we also rented a villa for two weeks in, in, in Provence. So, okay, let's put the kids in French day camp. And I went and cycled Mont Ventoux a couple of times, you know, like, so things like that, I would not have been able to do, would not have appreciated as much if it wasn't for the passion of, of sports. Um, And I just really want to be able to do more of that because it's such a fun way to incorporate travel and the passion with what you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I I agree with you. Uh, I would love to go do that one day. Uh, Me and the wife, we've talked about it, going over to Europe and then uh, doing some running over there, some sky running uh, running, Mm -hmm. and some cycling over there because, I mean, just... Completely different. And even when my daughter was 18 months, this is right when I started into trail running. Um, I I was lucky in that um, when I got into trail running, it wasn't very big yet here. So um, I I qualified for the world championships in Sweden. So my daughter was 18 months. So brought her to Sweden or Switzerland (laughs) where I did a race and then traveled where I would not have done that if I wasn't there to race, right? So it, it has brought some really great opportunities. And even when I went to Spain, I went on my own. I didn't have anybody with me. I mean, I had other athletes, but yeah. I went to Spain on my own. So I was able to just explore it on my own times, on my own turf, not worry about the kids' schedule. Um, and it was great. Life has given you some great experiences and uh, memories. That's great. That's awesome. What is your most memorable race? Oh, What's that one that just stands out? I would say the trans, um, the trans Rocky. Well, there's, there's two, sorry. Okay. One is, um, the trans Rockies, because that's where I did my first stage race, the three day stage race. And that was an experience um, that I've never, you know, it was my first time doing a stage race but it was also at altitude. And I did do a bit of altitude running when I was in Switzerland, but um, this was just a lot more significant. And um, I also was going through a really rough time in my life at that point. And uh, I remember a day before the race started just being just really upset emotionally. And again, talking to that energy healer before the race and she gave me the mantra, just run towards yourself. Because I, I, I told her, I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to be able to race. I'm just really upset. Yeah. And she just said, Jennifer, just run towards yourself. Use the energy of the mountains, the energy of the trees, and just trust that you will find it within yourself to race. And, um, you know, there was moments in the race where I would be, you know, tears down my face, but then other moments where I would just be in pure bliss, and just so happy to be there and feeling the strength coming from within and just being in awe of all of the runners around me. And what really stood out for me in that race was, you know, I would finish at the front of the pack. The race usually finished with a, with a river, like a creek. So I would go and immerse my body in the cold water. I would then get a massage. Then I would sit in the, um, those compression sleeves. Yes. Okay. And then eat my food. And then go back to the hotel. And as I'm driving back to the hotel, I would still see racers out there. And I was so in awe of those athletes because I'm like, they're the tough ones, not me. I could run fast, but they're the ones with the true grit and determination because they're out there double the amount as me, yet they have to show up on the start line at the exact same time as me. So I took such inspiration from those people. It was such a humbling experience and so motivating to see these people out there for so long with a smile on their face and showing up there at the start line on the very next day with me. So that was just a remarkable experience. And then I think the other one was 
that three day stage race where I got the concussion at Golden because okay. prior to hitting the head, my head, it was such a fun race and such a fun vibe. And I can't wait to go back and finish, finish what I started. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so here, so this is the question that we talked about with the, because we, you know, you, you mentioning the concussion uh, numerous times. So here's your question regarding that. So you, you suffered a concussion during a trail race back in 20, 2018. Mm-hmm. Can you, Take me on that journey. What transpired? What happened? And are you okay now? Have you recovered or are you still experiencing um, those side effects from the concussion? Yeah. Um, Yeah. So it's been pretty close to two years to the day. Um, Now I feel like I am 95% recovered. I think that 5% probably will always be there and it's it's just things that i can live with things like um my tolerance for noise um will always be lower um problems with my vision and a little bit of problems with my memory but otherwise i think from a day-to-day perspective i'm now back um but it was so to put it in context uh it was a three-day stage race and on day one um Day one went really well, but on day one, we experienced a lot of wet snow because we're up in the mountains. And mm-hmm. I have Raynaud syndrome, which means the circulation of my fingers and my feet is, it sucks. So on that first day, when I got to the top of the mountain, my fingers were in so much pain because, because they got so cold. Yes. So day two um, was a 60 day, uh, 60 kilometer day, 60 kilometer race with a lot of climbing. I think it was like an 18 kilometer climb. And we knew from the forecast that it was gonna be raining most of the day and then wet snow as it got into elevation. So I was really focused on staying warm. Um, So it meant that I had latex gloves plus gloves on on top of them. And I knew to just keep moving. Like that was my strategies. I just had to keep moving and we were, just about, we're about a third, I think a third of the way into the race, just before the climb. And I was trying to get the food out of my vest, but because I was already cold, I was losing the dexterity in my fingers. So I was having a hard time getting the food out of my vest, but I didn't want to stop moving because I knew I had to keep moving. And it was just bad timing that my head was down and I was wearing a ball cap, which I never do because it blocks my vision. (laughs) Um, but I wore it because of the rain and it just bad timing that my head was down. And as I got the food out of my vest and I started picking up the pace, there was one tree, one bloody tree in the entire 60 kilometers that you had to duck under. And I didn't (sighs) see it because of my ball cap and looking down. So I guess what happened was right as I started to pick up the speed and I wasn't even running fast. Um, I just, I hit the tree and all of a sudden I heard a big thump. It all went black and I saw the stars and then I heard another thump. And then I woke up and I see this tree in front of me. And then I'm like, oh, I must've hit the tree. Um, But I don't think I was out for very long because as far as I know, nobody ran by me. At least I'd like to think that nobody ran by me and did not stop. So I did a quick scan. Um, I did cut myself here, but not nothing major. I I started walking, um, but I honestly thought I felt fine, but I knew enough to say, well, Hey, you hit your head. Um, probably you are done racing because that was a race where I actually trained for, because I wanted to go and compete. Um, so I knew enough to say, I'm not going to race but I want to finish. I did the training and I honestly think that I am fine. And we had just started the climb, that 18 kilometer climb. So I was already doing running, walking, hiking, right? It it already changed paces. And I was just a little bit feeling, I was feeling a little bit off, but I felt the exact same way the day before because you're at elevation. So what I was feeling on day two was the exact same that I felt on day one. So I just thought I'm okay. 
and every single volunteer that I came across, the aid stations, I would explain to them, I hit a tree, do I seem okay? And everybody kept giving me the green light, saying, you seem fine, keep going. So I did. Um, and I finished the 60 kilometer race. Um, I'm not, I know it sounds horrible, but I honestly don't know if I would have done anything different if I were to do it again, because I honestly thought I felt fine. The only thing that should have really pinpointed it, like that should have said like, hey, something is not right, was at the top of the climb, you had to run along the ridge of the mountain for a couple of kilometers. And because there was snow, you could see the footprints of people sliding down the ridge a little bit, right? Because it was slippery. So when I got to the ridge, and I'd run along the ridge before in the French Alps, I knew what I was getting into, but seeing the snow and seeing people's footprints sliding a little bit freaked me out big time. And I'm talking massive panic attack, full on tears, screaming, all these nice runners tried to help me, but you couldn't, like I was literally sat sitting there on the mountain, freaking out, asking, I need the helicopter to come and get me. Um, and that should have been the sign to say something is not right. Yeah, exactly. But I was too caught up in the moment to, to realize it. But when I look back afterwards, um, but even then, like once I got over that panic attack and I got to the next aid station and I took a really long time um, eating French fries and pumpkin pie and changing my clothes, I then finished the race and I enjoyed it. There's parts of the race I don't remember. Um, but then that night I'm having dinner with my friends. I even had a glass of wine and we're joking about me hitting the tree and I felt fine. And then the next morning for day three, I remember being, uh, you know, when you're nervous for a race and you can't eat your breakfast because you're just yeah. mashed. Yes. I remember feeling that way and thinking, that's weird. I'm not racing. Why am I feeling nauseous? Yeah. Um, and then I got to the start line and I told my friends, you know, I'm just not feeling it. I think I'm just going to stay at the back of the pack. Okay. But I still thought I could run it easy. And then the gun went off and right then I knew it. I felt like throwing up. My head was pounding. So uh, I went back to the start line when I got checked out by paramedics, went to the hospital and then the process started, but it, it took five days to show all of the symptoms. Wow. Like that's, that's what I was saying earlier. It's not your typical, you hit your head and right away you feel this and this and this. It took me, it was only until that happened on a Saturday. It wasn't until the next Thursday where I really felt that all of the symptoms were coming out, where I started wow. to get worried that, uh oh, something's not right. Oh my God, that is, oh my God, that's crazy. And you still finished the race. Yeah. That's um, another thing that I'm just like, I, 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 I can't, like, uh, there's just, there's athletes and then there's amazing, like, incredible athletes like yourself. I, I um, still understand it because I am not, I'm usually a pretty sensible athlete. I'm usually the first one to back down when I have a niggle. I don't push through injuries. Like, I am quick to say, to look at the bigger picture and to be like, you know what, it's not worth it. I still don't understand how that all happened and how even that night I felt okay. And then even the Sunday when I pulled myself out of the race all day, I kept doubting myself, but I feel fine now. It must've all been in my head. It, it, it's so, it was so bizarre. And then wow. um, the doctors did say like, yeah, I probably did more damage by finishing the race. Um, which is scary because I really thought that I was okay. And I kept telling people, this is what I did. Am I okay? Yep. Continue. It just goes to show you don't know. And then for about a year, it was pretty nasty. Like the symptoms. Wow. It was a rough recovery. Well, I mean, that uh, touching on recovery, that's your next question. <laughs> so, um, when do you know when you should be taking a step back uh, when you're pushing too hard in order to recover? How does your recovery tend to look like? Um, well, I think the first thing is whenever something just starts to feel different, right? So if, 
if, if my running form feels different, that's a sign to say like, okay, something's not right. So I think because I've always respected that, I, I, I've usually been pretty good to not get myself to that point where major recovery is needed. I mean, I've had my share of injuries, don't get me wrong. Um, but I've been injured enough to see for myself that if you do it properly, the recovery, you'll only come back stronger. And that every single time you need to take a recovery, you learn something from it. And if you can pinpoint what you learn from it, it makes you such a better athlete. And I always think back to the analogy of the iceberg where, you know, as athletes with our months and our years of training, we build this amazing iceberg. And we tend to though, just focus on the part of the ice that you see above the water. And we forget about the ice that's underneath the water. So when we get injured, we need to remember that there's that solid foundation under the water that we just don't always pay attention to. And that if you have faith in that foundation, then it helps you to deal with, I need to take time off right now. And I need to trust the process. And I need to do what I need to do. And I remember a couple of years ago when I was writing more for sports magazines, I was interviewing a professional triathlete who had a major accident. He got hit by a car while cycling. Oh, wow. And I asked him about his recovery. And it really stayed with me, his approach, where he said, you know, when you're injured, you're still an athlete. So you take that energy that you had as an athlete and that you devoted towards your training. You now take that same energy and you devote it to your recovery. So for instance, the time you would have spent with your exercise outdoor, that hour, two hours a day, you now spend that one to two hours a day on your physio exercises. So you're still doing physical activity, but the focus changes. The importance that nutrition played when you're an athlete is now just as important to you now that you're recovering, but the types of foods you're choosing might be different, but the purpose is to help you recover. The rest is the same. The cross training is the same. And that helped me also to put things into context that when you're injured or when you need the recovery, all you're doing is changing that focus that little bit but you're still that same person because so many times when we are sidelined, we start to question ourselves, right? And we start to, we have that crisis identity. Well, who am I now if I can't do this? But it, it's, it just helps to bring it into the context and to refocus and to just have trust that, you know, you will get back at it. Of course. And then, you know, recovery is something that I had to learn the hard way. You know, there were times where I, my my mentality then would was if I have a day off, I'm gonna I'm gonna go and train. You know, mm-hmm. why am I gonna let it go to waste and sit down and watch TV when I can go and get stronger and stronger? And uh, I found myself at various races where my body was burnt. Mm-hmm. I mean, burnt and tired. My body it was like having no gas in the in the tank. I was burnt. Uh, yeah. muscle aches uh, and so with years and being in the sport of OCR um, uh, the one thing I learned from uh, uh, from my team was you know you gotta recover you gotta let your body recover it's the only way that you're gonna be able to succeed and then the longe- um, you know, you longevity. know maybe, longevity and and also building that strength and like you were saying um you need to recover and so that's something that i had to learn and now the, the, like you said the same amount of uh, time and effort that i put in my training i also i dedicate also to relaxing and recovering and, and, and doing the stretches and all the things that i need to do um it's not always about training so no you're right and even um you know, because there's, there's recovery when you're injured, but then there's the recovery in, in the week, right? And of course. one of the things I started doing with the athletes is instead of calling it a day off, I call it an adaptation day to help them realize that this day off is not about being lazy, right? right. But it's about, you need to give your body time to adapt to all of the training that you're putting in. 
right? To yeah. adapt to the stress. And I found that has helped people to accept that day better. And depending on the athlete, for some athletes, that adaptation day might be completely like you're doing nothing. Whereas for others, it might be, well, I can go for a swim because it's not adding the stress or I can go for a gentle hike. Yeah. But I find that has really helped some of the athletes um, accept it more readily. And then the other thing I find is, and I think it's part of the culture where, you know, it seems like I noticed with a lot of athletes that as soon as they, you know, start to feel good in their workouts, they're like, great, how do I challenge myself more? I'm ready for the next one. And it's always this continuous, like, I just need to do more and more and more and more. You give them an hour workout. Well, they do an hour and 10, an hour and 15. Like they're always doing more than what's prescribed. Yeah. Um, so I try to also emphasize, be happy with where you're at and take the time to notice your accomplishments. You are feeling good. Great. Hang out there for a little bit. Let the body absorb that feeling good. It's feeling good for a reason. Everything is ticking. So instead of trying to jump to that next level, just hang out there for a little bit first. And then we'll move to the next level as opposed to just, oh, I'm feeling good. Great. What's next? True. So Jennifer, talk to us about being a coach, your camp and the various types of training that you offer your clients, as well as retreats that you, that you offer. Talk to us about that. Oh, I love it. It's so much fun. <laughs> you know, like, oh, I'm just, I can, like every time I do those weekend camps or retreats, I'm just on cloud nine because there's just something magical that always happens without any effort of how everybody just comes together, supports one another, they can be complete strangers, and they just have so much fun. And anything I do with the coaching, the clinics, the retreats, it's really about promoting that passion for the sport, whether it's yeah. running in general, or just being good to yourself and trail running. Like I said, I wanna convert everybody to be a trail runner, <laughs> right? Um, I love that. But it, it's so much, it's so rewarding. It's so fun because, um, it, and, and it's like I said, you attract the people, you, you attract certain people. And the people that I've been connecting with are people who really want to enjoy running for the passion and right. the performance comes with it. Yes, they want to become a better runner, but there's an underlying passion for it. And I just... Like what I do in my clinics and then in my coaching, it's all based on personal experience. Like when I'm doing the hands-on clinics in the trail, so like the ones that I just did on the weekend, I'm sharing with them my experience and my knowledge. Um, it may not always be the techniques that I use, but I bring in like, you know, you can also try this and this and this. Um, so it just happens so easily. Um, and I'm also, big on, like I said earlier, quality versus quantity. So I'm all about time efficiency. So, you know, for the longest time, I was doing my own combo workouts where I would incorporate an easy run with strength training outside. Yeah. I prefer not to be in the gym. I'd rather use props in mother nature and get my strength work in. And if I combine it with the run so that my muscles are tired, I can get that burn and that challenge effect really easy. Yeah. So then it was like, why don't I just share this with other people? And if they're interested, great. And if they're not interested, not a problem. I'm still going to continue doing this for me. So that's kind of been how I've been evolving is just when I see something that works for me, I think, okay, would it work maybe for somebody else? Or if somebody gives me ideas, same with the pool running clinics. I do pool running because I saw for myself being injured, how I was able to maintain my fitness with pool running. And then wow. and getting to be, you know, every year you get older, running gets harder on the body. If I do pool running, I can get another intensity workout in without the damage to my body. Well, there's a lot of older runners. <laughs> Let's share that information with other people. Um, so that's, yeah, that's kind of how I've been structuring a lot of things is just by sharing what works for me and seeing if it applies to other people. 
The, the pool running thing, I find that interesting. I started to learn that uh, there are athletes that do that. Um, I, uh, what I tend to do is cycle, mountain bike, uh, instead of running at times. Uh, I incorporate it into my training just to keep myself uh, off my feet. Uh, but, you know, pool running is something that I've uh, heard of. Uh, I've seen... At various points in my life, I've seen people do, especially the elderly, mm-hmm. um, or um, and and I find it very interesting. And it's something that you know what I was told by a, a colleague of mine, uh, a friend of mine who's a trail runner, uh, that um, I should uh, I should try that and see if uh, it's something that I would enjoy. You know, to, uh, like I cycle a lot as well, and I do believe it makes me a better runner. And there's definitely times where I will incorporate you know, like I'll switch the hard running workout for hard biking workout because, you know, it can be so beneficial. But what I like with pool running is it mimics the running that much better, right? So when you're looking at trying to mimic the muscles and the power that's needed, pool running can be great. But pool running can be good for if you're injured and you can't run. It can be great as a recovery. So you've done a hard workout, get in the pool and do pool running. And it can also be a great way to add in another intensity workout without that wear and tear on the body, right? So it can be beneficial. And let's face it, it's really easy to to fake it, not fake it, but to be lazy in the pool. But what I, um, what I show people in my pool running clinics is my little cheat sheets. How do you get that hard workout? because you can pretty much take any workout you would do on the road or in the trail and mimic it in the pool as long as you apply a few basic principles. And let me tell you, it can be hard. Like there's times when I'm cursing, when I'm doing my pool running. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm there with the seniors. (laughs) I may have to reach out to you and uh, get some of those tips. Let's go pool running. (laughs) I don't mind trying it. All right, I'll show you. If it helps me, be that much stronger and uh in my running trail running listen yeah. i'm all for it mm-hmm. anything yeah. to gain that inch and to be that some more successful um when i go out and race so yeah listen i may just reach out to you Perfect. um what can we expect uh, from jennifer ferrioni uh when the season starts next year 2021 if you're running do you have any goals Oh, I'll be running for sure. I'm okay. like I said, I've taken a long enough hiatus that. Um, oh, so you're coming back? Wow. I do, and I like I miss the training. I, I really miss the training in terms of um, like I've, I've started to train again, like doing hard workouts every week and and starting to get longer runs. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I definitely want to do some stage races. I, I really enjoy stage racing. Um, like I said, there's Trans Selkirk that got postponed. Um, I'd love to go back and do Golden. Um, I'd love to go back to Europe and do some of the races in Europe. Um, so I definitely want to do that. And then I think because of COVID, it's it's making me look at things differently. So, you know, when I'm going away uh, this week, I'm going to be looking at some new ideas for trail running camps. Maybe smaller ones, but more frequent, incorporating them with different things. Um, yeah. Just trying to look for new opportunities and just continuing to share the passion for the trails. Let me ask you, when you say stage racing, would, would you consider that to be adventure racing? No, stage racing being uh, multi-days, multiple days. So like Trans Rockies that I did was three days of racing. So I forget the exact distances, but it would be like a marathon the first day, a half marathon the next day, but a lot of climbing the third day a marathon or close to a marathon. Okay. Okay. Um, Day racing like that. I would, I would be interested in trying like an obstacle course race at some point uh, because I think my running will come in handy. Um, Yes. And I think I can be, if I train properly, I can be strong as well in certain things. Um, I just don't want the ice cold water. <laughs> you know, I don't think they're going to have those anymore. But I mean, if the they do, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So um, because of COVID, they, they removed that obstacle, right? But I don't see that obstacle coming back. But I do see you being a fierce a competitor in someone with a big bullet in there, you know, the bullseye in the back because he, because of your running. And it's something that uh, I think that you you will do very well at at the elite level. Well, I, always- I would I would lo- if if you do it, let me know. I'm there. I will cheer you on. You can help train me. <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> I yes, I would. That um, I was good. I, I would always say I'm going to be. A- kick-ass master's runner one day just wait because I've always felt that I've never well I know I've never fully applied myself I've always held back in my training yeah. I've always held back with my racing simply because I have this idea in my head that if I that I can't combine the competitiveness with the passion which I know is not true at all yeah. almost everybody does it that's that, that's my own flaw but for that reason, I've always held back and I've always said, just wait, I'm going to be a kick-ass master runner once I figure out how to really do this. Well, I'm 46, so I got to get started <laughs> on this. Yes, you can. Um, I, to me, I, I also think that age is just a number. It's mm-hmm. all in your head. Mm-hmm. If, you know, uh, I feel at my prime. I feel strong. I don't think about age and I don't think about nothing else. And I am passionate about the sport. I'm also passionate about trail running. So when I run, I dig in deep and I grind it and I, Mm -hmm. and plus I love the sports. I love duathlon. Oh man. And so that, that's another one. So, uh, and I'm very passionate about these sports and I love doing them. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, apart from competing, I love doing them. I love when I love training as well and, and, and doing these sports and, and just getting that better, that much better. So when I go out and race, I I'm, I'm confident. If you had to pick between the three duathlons, trail running and OCR, which one's your like pure passion? OCR. Yeah. It's, and how many it, years have you been doing it? I've been doing this since 2000. Wow. 2012 2013 okay. something like that it was introduced to me by uh, an ocr elite athlete um i keep telling the story and the name jesse bruce he's a good friend he introduced me to uh to the sport of ocr and i was weighing 200 pounds i thought really? i was i thought it wasn't I, I thought it was the strongest man on earth i'm going in there weighing all this all, all, i got all this muscle because i used to be a weightlifter then okay. uh, back then uh, I never heard of the sport <laughs> and I was introduced. I was told to go and participate and I went, you know, and all these young kids and, and athletes, very thin. And I'm thinking I'm bigger than them. I can do anything here. The bell rang. They're all gone. I'm huffing and puffing. I think I got, when I got to the first obstacle, they all that just finished. <laughs> 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 but I, as I learned more about the sport and I know I, I first, I, I, I came to love the sport and the, the running behind it. I mean, it was hard, but I had to train for it. But I came to love running and OCR and then trail running. And then it's just, mm-hmm. no, I, I just, I, I developed this love for the sport, just like you have with trail running, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, oh I think the perfect example of the mesh is what I was telling you earlier about um, one of the years when we had the women's trail running retreat at Blue Mountain and yes. in the afternoon when they had the choice, you can either go for a trail run yeah. or you can go to the village. Half of them chose to go to the village to watch the OCR competition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> back, oh, that was really fun to watch. <laughs> that was, you know, that's a fun, that's funny. And, 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 and I was there, so many athletes around the world were there because that was the world's. It's huge. You know, to a lot of athlete, uh, OCR athletes, if you ask them, I mean, the, uh, if you ask them the most memorable experience here in Canada for OCR, they would, they would mention that time. The 2016-17 at Blue Mountain, it, is, it was an amazing experience. And to have you guys nearby and then the girls want to come and watch the OCR athletes, that's incredible. That's awesome. <laughs> See, we're destined to have this talk today. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. So is there anything, that, anything else you would like to mention that I might have uh, neglected? Any shout outs, any sponsors, 
anything that you I mean you've been super you've already said so much I mean um, you deserve it you deserve this spotlight and, and, and people deserve to know who you are the type of athlete that you are and just how amazing you are um you know from being a mom a, a runner a coach an author and you know, and, and, and the list goes on with the, the, with the many podiums and the world champion at duathlon. Come on. You, know, you deserve a standing ovation, but right now it's just me. <laughs> you know, you know, what comes to mind is just so many great people and companies along the way that have just supported me. And in my endeavors, you know, like when I first started out the Solomon store here in Toronto, they've always been so supportive. And I was always um, shy to approach them, approach yeah. them to ask about being, um, you know, one of their ambassadors. They're like, we've been waiting for such a long time for you to come up to us. But I was just too shy. And, and I just thought I'm not, you know, they're not going to want me to be represented by them right but they've been wrong. sort of over the years and then companies like five peaks the trail running series they were a huge help right from the get-go when i first started having ideas about doing trail running clinics i worked a lot with five peaks and they supported me with helping me that is awesome clinics. and now happy trail racing right and even two weeks ago I emailed, I sent out an email to the community about, I need some party tents for my trail running retreat because I, we got to be outdoors. So I need a cover right away. The race um, director, Jeff contacted me saying, we have tents you can use. Right. And um, it just seems that every time I reach out to somebody for help, our Tarek has been the same um, trail running company. Everybody has always been so kind and generous and has helped me in so many ways. And I think that is awesome. That's a big reason why I've been able to do the things I've been able to do is everybody is so amazing and so willing to help. And yeah. I keep telling people, all you have to do is ask. Like you okay. just need to ask and people are willing to help. Uh, when, when, we're, when we're done with this episode, I have a few questions to ask. <laughs> You know, uh, funny that you mentioned Five Peaks. Uh, I had Eric Darcy here um, uh, when I created uh, uh, Trail and Edited, because, like I was telling you before we started, you know, I love OCR, but I also love running and trail running. And so I decided to, you know, what we don't have enough spotlight on such, you know, on so many Canadian trail running mm -hmm. athletes out there that I need to have something separate and different. And so I created Trill and edited for that, for that purpose. And look, you're here. <laughs> and so, but I had Eric Darcy and he is just a marvelous man. And I've ran five peaks before and he is funny, outgoing, energetic. And I love the guy. I can't wait to have him on again. He's, 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 he's awesome. I knew yeah. Eric from before he got involved with five peaks and yeah, he is him and his wife, Sue, they're, they're quite the pair. Yeah. Hey, Eric, if you're listening, we're giving you a big thumbs up, Eric. Yeah. Big, th <laughs> big thumbs up. There you go. Now, uh, two part question here. So if people are looking to find out more about you, Jennifer, and about your camp and your retreats, where can they go? Um, they can go to my website, runtrailswithjen.com. Okay. Or they can just email me, uh, should know this by heart. Run the trails with me at gmail.com. <laughs> I'm not my greatest um, promoter. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> you should have told me. I could have said it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Just put it on the screen. <laughs> I could have. <laughs> but is there anywhere, anywhere else that they can go? Um, or are those the only two ways of being able to reach? I mean, they can find me on Instagram, but just with like Jen, Jen Ferroni. Okay. I have my, my, my personal Facebook page seems to get more traction than okay. run. Tra there's the run trails with Jen Facebook page as well. Um, so there's different, different ways. Okay. Yeah. Be the primary, okay. primary ways. And before we go, 
What is your biggest inspiration? My biggest inspiration? Yes, I thought I'd leave this for the end. Yeah, oh, it's a good question. I think it comes back to what I said earlier. My biggest inspiration is other people. Good. Like, it's, it's people that inspire me. People that, and it, it's, it's things that you don't expect, yeah. right? Like, I'm always inspired by things where you're just completely taken by surprise. And the kindness and generosity of other people. And I know that sounds corny. <laughs> it's not. But it, it really is, is true because, yeah, people are just amazing. And um, I've seen enough times that when life seems really crappy or shitty, there's always amazing things that come out of it. And um, when I was doing my Reiki training, the instructor said something along the lines of when you can see the rose coming out of the shit, <laughs> that's like, that's what you're aiming for. <laughs> and that always stuck with me. And I'm sure she said it in much better ways. <laughs> that was a good way. <laughs> <laughs> you should put that on a shirt. <laughs> yeah, that be said by Janet. Um, but it's just like, that's what inspires me is that. Awesome. Goodness comes out of everything, no matter what it is. And even with COVID right now, I'm constantly yeah. looking for the goodness that is coming out of COVID because there are some things that are coming out. You just, you have to make that intention to look for it. I agree with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think that uh, for me personally, I think that uh, something came out of COVID-19 uh, COVID that, that the world slowed down. Every person, every human being in this world slowed the hell down. Nobody's in a rush to get from point A to point Z. Now we're all taking our time getting from point A to point B to point C in a normal pace. Everybody slowed the hell down. We're not in a rush. We have more time for family. We, like you said before, it's not quantity, it's quality. And I think that everybody is experiencing that now. And we're, um, we're loving this time that we have that we get to spend with ourselves that we get to relax and chill and that we get to spend with family i get to spend with my family i get to train properly i get to enjoy life i'm not in a rush yeah uh, i think you know uh, yeah i i think that something did come out of covid19 that was a positive thing for humankind yeah. for humanity i think so and that needs to go on the t-shirt as well yeah, that whole thing that I just said. That's a big shirt. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, it ha Jennifer, it has been truly a pleasure speaking with you. Um, I've learned so much. I'm inspired by you. And I said this before we started, and I say this to you. Now I am inspired by you. And I hope that everybody listening and watching is inspired because you are just an amazing person an amazing athlete and I can't wait for all to see you back out there, whether it's doing a duathlon or trail running. I would love to know when, and I will be there with the wife so we can cheer you on. And uh, I wish you all the best in your training. And uh, once again, I can't wait to see you getting out there and running again. Why, thank you very much, Juan Carlos. <laughs> did I say it properly? <laughs> yes, you did. At last, somebody got it right. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank it's you. not easy. I know. <laughs> this has been wonderful and very humbling. So thank you very much. Very great. Oh, I mean, you're welcome. And it's an honor. And thank you. I mean, to everybody listening, thank you for listening and for watching. Uh, I hope you guys learned as much as I have. Uh, I hope you guys, you guys are inspired by this, by Jennifer. And I hope you get out there and train and enjoy yourselves. Enjoy life. Train properly. Recover, please. Mm -hmm. And uh, get out there. Enjoy. Um, Jennifer, once again, thank you for making the time to speak with me. Enjoy your evening. And I hope we can do this again. I would love so, that. Thank you. You have yourself a, good, uh, a lovely evening. Take care, everybody, guys. Take care, guys.